Hi, hi, everybody. We're starting live. Hopefully you can hear me. Let's see if anyone can hear me in the comments. I have Rhonda and Ramona checking in with us. Hi, Ramona. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you guys online. We really appreciate you coming. We'll give everyone just a little time to snuggle on into this room with us while we get ready for our common tomato problems in the garden. I know that I have a ton of tomatoes right now and Marcy, unfortunately, they come with a ton of problems sometimes. So yeah, that they do. They do. So I'm very, very happy to have um, have you with us today. And um, Ann Shellman in the comments says, hi, Marcy and Lauren. Hi. hi. <laughs> It's really great that we have a lot of new people to gardening. Um, some of us staying locked in home, uh, not going to work, working from home. So I know I've had more time to garden. So tomatoes are one of those plants that a lot of people are putting in their garden these days because it's one of the easier ones to grow. It's like the basic starter package, I like to say, about tomatoes and about strawberries. And there's nothing better than a fresh picked tomato for your salad or, or dinner. I mean, there's just oh, something about it. There is something about it. All right, it's 12.03. We've got a bunch of people joining us still, but let's get started. Hi, my name is Lauren Snowden. I'm the statewide training coordinator for the UC Master Gardener program. We are very happy to have with us today, Marcy Souza, who is the San Joaquin UC Master Gardener program coordinator. Uh, one of the great things we love about Marcy's group right now is they're trying to go more online and doing digital things and extending this, um, our education through the digital format, and so are we. And we asked Marcy to join us today and give us a little bit of her presentation on common tomato problems in the garden. Um, I would like to say that uh, with all the new people to gardening, that there's been so much interest in the UC Master Gardener program, and our volunteers are responding really well to this by moving into online formats. So thank you to all of our participants joining us online. If you want to put where you're from and say hi, we'd love to see where you're joining us from. I'm currently in Sutter County, and Marcy is in San Joaquin County. So although we are not together, we are together online. So once again, thank you for joining us. And Marcy, if you would like to share your screen, I would love to pass it over to you so you can get started with your great presentation. All righty. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to give you all some tips and suggestions of curing common potato or potato tomato problems in the garden. Um, there's a lot of things that we see in backyard gardens that are very common. A lot of gardeners don't know what they are um, dealing with. Um, and so that's what I want to cover today is just some of the basics that our master gardener sees as questions in our office and how we can manage those problems. So the first thing when we are dealing with tomato problems is you know, we, we encourage people to identify the affected part of the plant. What part of the plant is having the problem? Is it the tomato itself, the actual fruit? Um, are the leaves showing signs and symptoms of stress or issues? The stems? Um, are you having issues with your, with your flowers? Is it the roots? Note the differences. Compare a healthy um, tomato plant that you may have in your garden to one that may not be doing so great. How do they differ? And note those differences. This is really helpful when you are communicating with master gardeners, trying to explain what you're seeing, what the problems are. And look for insects, and this would also go for diseases. What do you see on your plants? Do you see signs of insects? Do you see chew marks? Do you see frass? Um, do you see discoloration in the leaves from maybe a disease? The biggest component that I can give as a takeaway message today is it's so important to identify the problem before you treat it. A lot of times we get callers into our helpline office that say, well, I sprayed this, this, and this, and they really didn't need to use any of those chemicals or treatment methods um, for whatever their problem actually was. So when we are growing tomatoes, there are a couple of just general control methods, things to keep in mind when you first start, when we're planting, when we're thinking about um, growing tomatoes in our garden. So one of the things that is important to do, if you can, is crop rotation. And what crop rotation um, helps with is enhancing soil for fertility. Um, it can help minimize insect and um, diseases and pests that can be found in the soil. Many of these diseases and pests overwinter um, so if we're planting tomatoes in the same 
garden bed, same pots, same section of your garden year after year after year, there's a good chance that a disease or a pest that you dealt with last summer could show up again in your next uh, tomato garden. And avoid planting tomatoes when we're talking about crop rotation um, or other nightshades, which includes eggplants, peppers, potatoes in the same location for more than two years in a row. So we would want to make sure that we're also not just rotating the tomatoes, but don't plant those eggplants, peppers, or potatoes in that same spot that you may have had tomatoes um, because they all are affected by many of the same pests and diseases. When you are shopping for tomato uh, plants or seeds, you can um, give your plants kind of an extra boost um, by buying, purchasing disease resistant varieties. And so if you're looking at a plant tag on transplants, or if you are looking on a website um, at seed packets, you'll see abbreviations that stand for different diseases. And these are common tomato diseases that we at least see here in San Joaquin County. Um, there are some other ones that affect more commercial tomato crops, and you might be in a part of the state that um, you're affected by other tomato diseases. Um, but this is what we deal with here. These are common backyard tomato diseases. And so you can see the acronyms. F stands for um, resistant to fusarium, fusarium wilt. Um, FF is races one and two of fusarium wilt. N is for nematodes. T is resistant to tobacco mosaic virus. TSW is tomato spotted wilt, and V is for verticillium. And so we're going to talk about all these diseases um, when we get to that section. Okay, so when you are planting, um, you want to make sure that you plant deeply uh, to give your roots a better chance to get deeper for better growth. Tomatoes are a deeper rooted um, vegetable plant. If you purchase a transplant or if you're growing your own seeds to transplant and you have a real leggy tomato, you can see in this diagram here, um, example B, where they planted the tomato almost like in a trough just to kind of bury some of that stem so that you don't, you're not starting off with such a leggy um, tomato plant. You definitely want to follow the spacing suggestions um, on the label to give your tomato plants plenty of room. They may seem small when they're going in the ground. You may think I can pack these in a little bit tighter to squeeze in um, one or two more plants, but you really want to allow ample spacing, um, you know, two feet to even three feet on some varieties. Uh, and this allows for good airflow that we'll talk about later that can lead to some um, diseases and problems. We wanna make sure that there are fruits getting plenty of light and things like that. Um, when it comes to watering, Tomatoes are, are susceptible to lots of issues related to watering, and we want to make sure that we are um, watering to maintain uniform soil moisture. We're watering consistently, so you know you don't want to water for three days in a row and then forget to water for four days and then go out and um, water your tomatoes. That can really stress the plants. You also want to make sure that you are watering at the base of the plant using drip irrigation, furrow, um, but try to avoid spraying with a hose um, or a sprinkler type irrigation or watering where you're getting the fruit and the foliage uh, wet on those plants. Okay, so the first um, section of disorders we're going to talk about are abiotic disorders. And um, this is just a fancy way of saying environmental disorders. Um, these are non-living causes that can be environmental or cultural factors, um, and it can even just be the genetic makeup of the plant. All right, I think the one of the more popular ones that we see in our office is blossom end rot. And this is where your fruit will start to get a dark, leathery, brown, sunken area um, on the lower end or the blossom end of the tomato. Um, the issue, the main issue with this is a low level of calcium in the fruit, not in the soil. So a lot of times we'll see people um, saying, well, I added eggshells to my soil and this still happened. Um, California soils typically are not um, low in calcium. Uh, we have plenty of calcium usually in our soils. And so this is an issue of calcium in the fruit. When the fruit is in certain developmental stages, um, it needs this calcium to form correctly. Um, so we typically see blossom end rot when fruits are growing from a third to half size. 
So kind of this rapid um, expansion um, in, in size and, and growth. And um, if there's any water stress, so again, like we forget to water or maybe it gets really hot. We went from mild spring-like weather straight into summer and the plant goes through some type of stress. Um, what happens is water will go to the leaves primarily to keep the plant alive and um, taking that calcium to the leaves rather than the developing fruit that really needs the calcium at that time. So this is one of them, uh, the disorders that actually gets two slides to talk about because it's so um, common. Oh, hey, Marcy, it's Lauren. It looks like your share screen disappeared. What? I know. It makes me sad. So All if you right, want to so get that up, I'll entertain our folks. Um, <laughs> who has blossom end rot? Raise your little hand in the um, chat because I have blossom end rot and I have to say that the rest of the tomato was fine. I just cut off that piece and I eat the rest. I I was talking about ugly fruit the other week and if, it, if it's ugly, you guys can still eat it, okay? So don't throw it out. I felt like a failure at first. Oh, we have someone in the co uh, comments. Heather, you had a blossom end rot. I mean, just cut off the ugly part, right? Like, let's just cut it off. Let's still eat our fruit. Marcy, do you, um, I can see your presentation now. Uh, do you have ugly fruit that you just cut off the bad part and eat as well? You definitely can just cut off the, the the part that does not look pretty and enjoy the rest of your tomato with this one. There are some diseases that affects the entire tomato and um, can affect the quality, but blossom end rot really just affects that blossom bottom end, um, and you can definitely enjoy the rest rest of the tomato. Perfect. So you can see this. Let me advance the slide to make sure that. Oh, per good job. Okay. So um, blossom end rot can be prevented. Um, typically, we also see blossom end rot in the, in the spring. Um, so once summer gets going and, and we're on our second um, production of tomatoes, uh, we, we typically don't see it as much. It's one of the earlier uh, problems that we see. But good soil management, careful monitoring of soil moisture, um, trying to limit stress as much as possible. Um, if you have a sandy soil, you can, or, or poor quality soil, you can incorporate compost to increase that organic matter and try to help retain moisture, which will help um, diminish or lessen the soil moisture fluctuations that you might be seeing. And then just like Lauren said, you can cut off the blossom in rot area and enjoy the rest of your tomato. Okay, cat facing. Lauren, can you see that? I just want to make sure we're still going. Yep, I can see that. And I recognize that because I had all that last year. All Not right. This year, so, last year. <laughs> so cat facing, some people, you know, I've heard people say that, well, my heirlooms look like this. And that can be the case. There's certain heirlooms that are kind of gnarly looking. But cat facing um, is distinct. You'll kind of get that um, quirky looking texture in between the fruit rather than an heirloom that would stay consistent, um, nice pinkish or green flesh. And so cat facing is, is caused by cool or cloudy weather at blue time, bloom time really causes this. Um, there's not a lot you can do because again, this is environmental. You can't control the, the clouds or the weather. Um, you can make sure that you are planting your tomatoes a little bit later in the season, just to make sure that um, our weather is warmed up, the soil is warmed up. And um, we're giving our, our tomatoes, you know, that a support and a, a healthy chance for proper development. But there's not a lot you can do to control the weather. I certainly try. And again, and here's another weather one, fruit cracks. Um, so the cracking from the top down, you can also see circular cracking sometimes on tomatoes that um, would go around the top of the tomato. And this occurs during rainy periods or when we might get, um, you know, summer rain following long dry periods. This can also occur when fruit is exposed to the sun, it can develop cracks. So some things that we want to think about doing again is maintaining uniform water supply, watering at the base. Um, if your fruit has a lot of water sitting on top, that's not good. You want to make sure that you are providing um, a full canopy of leaves to help protect the fruit from the sun, which will help reduce cracking. So a lot of people will um, prune their tomato plants, um, which is okay, but you want to make sure that you don't prune them to the point to where you've gotten rid of all of the um, foliage and everything that provides protection from the sun. Okay, leaf roll. Um, this happens for several reasons, but typically plant stress. And so um, the leaves may feel firm, 
They may feel and look leathery. The plant looks wilted all of a sudden. And this um, typically we see when the plant is stressed. Here in San Joaquin County, we really see this when it's hot. When we have these um, three, four, five days in a row of 100 plus temperatures, this is kind of just a survival me method for the plants. And typically this goes away that the leaves will um, go back to normal once weather and conditions are ideal again. There are some insect pests that can cause leaf roll, but typically you wouldn't see it on the entire plant. It would be sections um, that the pest is maybe living in or something like that. But if it's the whole plant that you're seeing the leaf roll, it's typically heat stress, water stress. Um, it's a survival tactic. I have a confession. I have a plant that looks exactly like that right now. He's on the end. He's not doing well. I think he's mad about all the sunshine he's been getting. So... Yeah. So, so something you could do, you know, if, if you have um, this tomato plants, obviously they need sun, but sometimes too much sun can stress the plant out. And so you can provide shade, um, possibly like a patio umbrella or rigging up some type of shade cloth where the plants are still getting sun, but that two, three, four o'clock, you know, five o'clock even direct sunlight um, that can just beat down on our plants kind of give them a break um, in the, the hot afternoon. As long as the other plants don't get jealous, I'll provide some shade. Exactly. All right. So sunburn or sun scald. Again, this is another thing uh, that is just caused sunburn. Like we get sunburn from too much sun. Your fruit can get, um, fruit and vegetables can get sunburned. And so you'll see on the exposed side, this the uh, flesh will turn white or yellowish kind of color. Um, Again, we want to just provide adequate leaf cover to make sure that um, the, the fruit is protected from the sun, um, provide partial afternoon shade. So again, those patio umbrellas or beach umbrella, shade cloth, something to just protect the plants. If you can't um, even tuck them in or kind of rearrange your vines, if you need to, to provide some, some shade for the, the tomatoes. All right, so up next are some common diseases that we see in tomatoes. Black mold um, favors wet conditions. So we're watering a lot. So we're not giving the soil a chance to dry out. And there's a lot of humidity going on. So maybe our plants are planted too close. That's why the spacing um, is important. We wanna make sure that we're watering at the soil level, at the base and not watering the leaves and the fruit. And you know, when the afternoon weather Temperature heats up. Um, it just makes that environment humid. So keep your plants dry. Make sure they have enough room to breathe, per se, um, you know, enough spacing in between them. And you shouldn't shouldn't have this issue. If you see it, you definitely want to um, get rid of the tomatoes that are affected so that the mold spores don't continue to spread. Okay, Marcy, so I'm not going to eat these, right? Like, I'm going to throw this directly in the trash. That I don't want to... Yeah, I don't want to compost those, do I? You do not want to put it in your compost pile. Yeah. You do not want to try to eat that or salvage it uh, and make it into, you know, pasta, sauce, or anything like that. That's one that you're going to want to bag up and throw into the trash can. All right. Bypass all. Go right to trash. Okay. Straight to trash. So this is another right. two uh, issues that would go straight to the trash can. So fusarium okay. and verticillium wilts. So if we were purchasing um, plants, we're going to look for a F or FF. Um, and a V on the label if we're trying to find um, plants that are resistant to these diseases. But with both of these, they're similar, but just a little bit different. So um, the plants will start to turn yellow. Um, either the leaves or the actual um, tomato vines will start to turn yellow. Eventually, they just look like they're dying. And eventually, this can spread throughout the entire plant. Um, you can see the discoloration, the yellowing on the leaves in that bottom picture. And if you were to take a tomato vine and cut it, um, a plant that would be infected with verticillium or uh, fusarium wilt would look something like that top picture where you've got the healthy green um, layers of tissue and then you've got that brown discoloration on the inside. And again, they're both a little bit different, but very similar. Um, you really are just looking to plant resistant varieties uh, crop rotation is important because these diseases can overwinter in the soil. We don't want to plant um, peppers, eggplants, potatoes in this spot next year. Um, you either want to let it go fallow or plant something else that's in a different family. 
And we're just going to rip out those entire plants. Um, once you think that your tomato plant has fusarium or ver verticillium wilt and bag roots, fruit, leaves, everything, and throw it in the trash can, not the compost pile. Okay, tobacco mosaic virus will give, your leaves will have this yellow, white, light green modeling look to them as you see in that top picture. Sometimes it um, does resemble um, a nutrient deficiency. And so it can be hard you know, to identify at first, but one of the telltale signs of tobacco mosaic virus, and we've seen this in our office, is the shoestring looking leaves that you can see in that bottom photo. And so the leaves um, will get very skinny, very stringy looking and distorted. And uh, this virus is carried um, typically on the hands and clothing even of people that use tobacco products. And so um, this is something that there's no cure for. You'll want to dispose of the plants in the trash. It will produce fruit, but the plant itself won't do very well. The fruit is not going to be great. Often it, it doesn't um, turn red or whatever color it's supposed to end up. Um, it doesn't get a very um, large in size. And so it's best just to dispose of the entire plant. And your best bet for controlling this is just not to allow um, tobacco products or people that use tobacco products, make sure we're washing our hands thoroughly, um, maybe even changing your shirt before you allow somebody out in the garden that does use tobacco products. Okay, tomato spotted wilt virus. This is TSW if we're looking for resistant varieties on a plant label. And this virus is transmitted by thrips. And we're going to talk about thrips later. Um, but basically, you can see the pattern, the, the distortion they make on the actual fruit, um, the discoloration. You can see the markings on the leaves. And you can't really do anything about this virus. We're looking to control the actual insect that vectors this virus. And again, we'll talk about thrips later. But if you see these circular uh, patterns on your tomatoes, you didn't you didn't have an alien visit at night. It's definitely thrips. So, Marcy, this is Lauren. I did think I had aliens at first, and then I realized that I planted a variety that had some modeling to it. So. I remembered because I did my plant journal and wrote down that I planted this one tomato. So I went and looked it up. I thought I had this. I did not. So once again, knowing what you're looking at, knowing what plant it is and what it's supposed to look like is going to help you diagnose what's going on. So I thought it was something bad. It was just the tomato. It was the actual was, tomato. And that could yeah. be, that could be, you know, you might have a, a modeled looking um, tomato plant that that's what the fruit is supposed to look like. But knowing, looking at the leaves, you see symptoms of the yeah, there's so the more. And there's a lot going on. And, you know, right now, many of our master gardener offices are working remotely. And so any photos that you can get, if you're sending questions into your helpline offices, not just of the fruit, but close-ups of the actual tomatoes or whatever other vegetables or fruits you're, you're questioning about, the leaves, um, close-ups, further back, all is helpful in helping us uh, diagnose or allowing us to diagnose what might be going on with your plants. Problem solving at its best. All right. So now we have some common pests. Ah, the tomato hornworm. So wow. this bugger I have left for work and had a healthy tomato plant and come home to nothing but sticks um, <laughs> in one work day. So these uh, hornworms will eat the leaves. They eat the stems. They eat the fruit. Um, they are very large. If you've ever seen a tomato hornworm, they, they often remind me of like a banana slug, if you've seen one of those in, in size comparison. They're gigantic. And um, really your best control method is looking for these, these guys. They, they do camouflage well if you have um, a lot of foliage on your plants, but they do have these mandibles in, that you can hear clicking, um, especially at night. So you'll want to go out Put on your turn up, turn up your ears, and you can listen for them if you think you have tomato hornworms doing damage. And you'll just want to hand pick those. If you have chickens, chickens love them. Um, you can snip them with your pruning shears, but it's it's not something that you just want to relocate. You definitely want to um, get rid of this pest. Uh, Marcy, just a tidbit for anyone who has chickens: chickens really like to eat these too. They do. Yeah, they do. And they do have natural enemies. Um, there are some parasitic wasps and things like that that will come in and um, help 
battle tomato hornworms, but really, you know, if, if you know you've got them, the quickest and easiest way is just to go out there and hand pick them and, and get rid of them yourself. I'm not a fan, my friend. Not a fan. Not a fan. They are pretty gross, too, if you've ever stepped on one. <laughs> okay, so I've seen lots of pictures of these on our Facebook pages and our helpline office. This is not just a tomato specific pest, um, leaf footed bugs. And so these, uh, depending on when they attack your tomato plants, if it's smaller fruit, they can cause the fruit to abort. If the fruit's a medium to larger size and you start getting leaf footed bugs in your garden, um, they can cause light depressions. Um, or colored, light colored pithy spots. They are a, a piercing sucking insect. So everywhere where they pierce their mouth part in, um, that makes a little indentation and can, can leave it corky or pithy. So to manage these, and you typically also don't see one. So this is a very deceiving picture where it's one leaf footed bug. Um, they typically run in packs. And so um, where there's one, there's gonna be more. Um, you can make sure that you have good sanitation over winter of um, keeping the weeds down. They like to, to overwinter their weed-free areas. But really, when they're actually in your garden, you want to just look at handpicking, crushing them, shaking the vine and maybe like a five-gallon bucket of soapy water to drown them. But you want to dispose of them. Um, they have this telltale sign if you're trying to figure out what, um, what bug might be on your tomatoes. And you can see those those back legs actually look like little leaves attached. Um, and so that's that's how you can tell a leaf footed bug rather quickly is, is look at their when they're an adult. The larvae looks a little bit different. But Marcy, I did take a question online once about leaf footed bugs and this person loved to dispose of them by using their dust buster to suck them up. Very and nice. I know they didn't have to touch them. So if you are someone who does not want to touch a bug, apparently get a dust buster and you're Shop good to back. go. Shop <laughs> back. I mean, you know, the sky's the limit on that. Do um, what you got to do. <laughs> Hand pick or shop back <laughs> pay the kids or grandkids to go out and you know pick all these off i mean i'm all about creative pest management <laughs> all right so nematodes if we are um looking for nematode resistant plants we're going to be looking for the letter n and root knot nematodes cause these galls so that photo that you're looking at it's not actually the nematode um, nematodes are microscopic but that is the damage that they do to the roots. And what happens with this is um, it, it interferes with nutrient flow, with water flow up into your plant. And eventually your plant just maybe stalls out. It's not growing very well. It's not getting bigger. Nothing's happening. Um, and so a, one way that you can find out if you have nematodes is kind of just dig around at the soil level till your roots are exposed. And if you see these knobby, nodular looking um, bumps on the roots, then that's um, most likely you've got root, not nematodes. Often we will see little bumps. I've had people ask on the actual tomato vines and, and branches, and many tomatoes will have that as a, a regular natural characteristic. This is the root area that we're looking for. We're looking for these larger um, knobby um, bumps and things like that. So you want to practice good sanitation, um, look for plant resistant, um, disease resistant, nematode resistant varieties. And then if you have an infestation of um, root knot nematodes, you want to either practice crop rotation. You can do soil solarization. It's a great time right now. We have nice hot weather. You put the plastic down, you can look more, um, look, uh, look up soil solarization online. You see has some great handouts on that. Um, or you can just let the soil go fallow, which means you don't plant anything in there for a while. And don't give the nematodes a host plant to, to survive off of. All right, snails and slugs. I mean, I think these are a pest everywhere in your ornamentals, fruits, flowers. So these uh, pests will chew holes in your fruit, in the leaves, in the flowers. Um, really, we're looking for management of reducing their hiding places if you can. So they like to hide under boards and rocks and, you know, maybe you've got just some junk stuff piled out by your garden. Um, they love to hide in watering cans. So kind of just clean up your area, tidy things up and eliminate places that they can hide. Uh, hand picking is very effective. My grandma used to pay me to pick snails out of her garden um, nice. when I was little. <laughs> it was great. And, you know, there's many ways to trap sell snails. You can look all this up on the IPM website, which I'll talk about later. Um, baits are effective when they're properly used in conjunction with some type of cultural practice. So that kind of means, a you know, collaboration of everything, of handpicking, 
trapping, making sure we're eliminating hiding places and baiting. Um, you kind of have to do it all together to be successful with, with snails. And they do come out at night. So going out at night to handpick, uh, they don't like it when it's hot. So they're going to be out when it's cooler, dark, and that would be a good time to go out and look for many of these pests um, if you're trying to handpick them. I do like to go to my garden with the flashlight and just check out what's going on around 10 o'clock to see what's happening. It's amazing all the things that come out at night, moths and, and different pollinators and things like that that are out moving in the garden along with pests that we don't want. Hey, Marcy, can we take a break and answer Linda's questions? She would like to know what fallowing means. Fallowing means you just let the soil lay undisturbed. You don't plant anything in it. Um, we're not going to give a pest or disease a host plant to live off of and, and continue to thrive. And if, if they don't have a food source to live um, off of, then eventually many times these diseases and pests will, will go away. Um, but I think, you know, there's other methods. If, if you want to keep growing vegetables and maybe you don't have a lot of spaces to move your plants to, you know, to plant someplace else, then we'd want to look at crop rotation or um, the soil solarization. But fallow just means you don't plant anything in it for a while. Farmers will do that to allow their fields to kind of replenish nutrients. They might plant like a cover crop to help rebuild nutrients, but they won't plant a, a crop in it for a season just to give it a break. Um, I know that I followed my garden for two years and just concentrated on patio gardening because I got mm -hmm. some great pots and got really into that for a while. And now I'm doing patio gardening and my uh, regular gardens back on track. So I accidentally yes. followed. So, well, that's good though. It's good. Yeah. We all need to break every once in a while. Okay. So stink bugs, there's many, many different types of stink bugs. Um, these are another piercing sucking insect. And so you can see the damage that they do. All of those spots on that tomato pictured are, are where a stink bug of some kind um, stuck their mouth part in, sucked out some juices, and, and left that discoloration. Often um, with stink bugs, the, the fruit will get hard, but it'll be pithy or corky underneath the skin. So it's sometimes if you have a heavy infestation of stink bugs, you might be able to salvage the fruit and cut off the bad parts. Um, but if they've had an all-you-can-eat tomato buffet, you might lose some fruit um, from stink bug, bug damage. You're looking at hand picking or uh, the shop vac or the, the hand vacuum would be another great way of sucking up stink bugs. They also like to overwinter um, in the weeds, ground covers. So we want to make sure that our garden is tidy in the spring before populations can start to build up um, where they're infesting your vegetable garden. All right, thrips. So this was the um, insect that I talked about earlier that vectors the wilt virus. And they are very tiny, but that top picture might be a little challenging to see, but you can see the little yellow specks all over the leaves. And that is a, a telltale sign of thrip damage on the leaves. They, um, the leaves can turn yellow, they'll get the stipling spots, and they can even drop prematurely prematurely um, if, they, if there's enough damage on them. Thrips do have many um, beneficial insects that are, are predators. Um, and so often thrip control will take care of itself when you let the good guys come in uh, to your garden. But if you do see thrips infestations going on, you'll want to prune out those infested and damaged um, vines. We're gonna throw them away in case there's any insects that are hanging on that we can't see. Cause again, they're very tiny very hard to see. And you can see the damage done to that picture of the tomato. Um, that tomato would have been either the thrips doing damage to the blossom or the fruit when it was very, very young, very small. And it gives that permanent scarring, permanent puckering and kind of um, misshapen look to it. We actually just got a thrips question on nectarines and the nectarine looked just like that, looked horrible. They'll kind of scab over as well too, where the thrips are chewing and, and sucking. Okay, white flies are really common, really hard to control. So, you know, as soon as you walk out into the garden and go to stick your hand in to pick a tomato, often you'll see, you'll have this swarm of white flies that hit your face and um, they're just all over the place. So white flies are a um, sucking insect. And so they are sucking those sugars from your plants. The leaves will start to turn yellow. They can appear dry. They can fall off. 
White flies are one of several insects that will excrete honeydew, um, which is that sticky substance. If you've ever parked underneath a big shade tree, you come out and your the sidewalk sticky or your windshield is sticky, that's honeydew. Um, so white flies do excrete honeydew. Um, you might get that see that sticky substance on your leaves. With that, you can get sooty mold that starts to grow. So it can just be this whole snowball effect of, of issues. Um, often too, if you have white flies, you'll see a lot of ants. The ants like to um, harvest the and eat the honeydew. So many interconnected problems once you start getting white flies. They do have natural enemies. They are very hard to control um, using insecticides, pesticides, things like that. So you'll want to, if you can, you know, go out maybe with a bag in one hand, pruners in the other, prune off um, a heavily infected leaf or branch, you know, vine, um, if you can, before they have a chance to fly away. Yellow sticky traps um, can be posted around the garden hung up um, to help uh, attract adults and help control them that way a little bit. But they're really difficult to control. Um, it's... I mean, if you got them, you've got them often, but the yellow traps do help. All right, some other common pests that we didn't talk about in the specific um, PowerPoint today, but definitely you see them out in the garden. Cutworms, these, uh, the, the picture that you see of the, the caterpillar on top is a cutworm. It typically will um, make a C shape if it gets disturbed or startled. These, uh, this pest here will cut your plants off usually right at the ground. Um, we also see tomato fruit worms, aka um, the same pests that you see in corn, so like an earworm, and they chew holes in the fruit. So you'll see that uh, fruit worm damage in that bottom picture. Pinworms make much tinier holes, usually around um, where the tomatoes attach to the plant. A lot of pin holes there from that worm. So there's lots of other um, pests that we see out in the garden um, that we didn't cover today. And more information can be found on our IPM website, which is the Integrated Pest Management website. I'm going to show that here in a minute. Um, along with, you know, creepy crawly caterpillars and things like that, don't forget about pests like rats, uh, rabbits, birds, possums, cats. I had um, a friend whose cat would eat the tomatoes off their uh, vine <laughs> and couldn't figure out what was chewing on the tomatoes and until they caught the cat in action of doing it. So there's lots of, um, you know, critters that might come in at night. If, if you live along a, a riparian area, levees, you might have things like raccoons, um, you know, possums, things like that, that, that might be coming in. You'll want to try to figure out what's causing the damage and you may need to provide some type of protection around the beds or construct some type of cage that you can net to keep things like birds out. Um, you'll just have to be smarter than whatever's, you know, eating your, your fruit and then herbicides. Um, if you're spraying your yard, it's a little bit breezy. Herbicide drift can cause damage to plants that looks like many diseases of the stringy looking leaves or the discoloration and, and modeling and, and, you know, development. So you definitely want to make sure that if you are using any herbicides or pesticides in your yard, that. You're following the label, following the instructions, and um, applying them at the best time of day um, and avoiding any type of contact or drift with your vegetable plants. All right, so our IPM website, and again, that was for integrated pest management. The web address is right there underneath that picture of the tomato, but this is a really great resource for any home gardener. Um, it that starts off with some cultural tips on fertilizing, how to harvest, when when to harvest, how to store, proper planting, pruning. You can see everything there. Um, soil recommendations, watering, and then it gets into list of the most common invertebrate pests, diseases, um, abiotic disorders, and each one of those you would be able to click on. You know, maybe maybe you've got a problem and you're trying to figure out what it is. You could go to the IPM website and just start clicking through everything on this list to see if it matches the symptoms or the signs that you've seen on your plants and, you know, go through and nope, not aphids. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, it really does look like a leaf footed bug. Let me kind of write that one down and then come back and, and keep going through the list. And this list is cut off. It's just a screenshot, but this is a great resource. It will give the 
life cycle. If it's an insect, um, it gives the damage and it also gives, you know, management. So it walks you through the whole thing of understanding what you're dealing with, the damage that it can do and, and the best way to control it. Practice using these IPM practices of, you know, always starting off with the most environmentally sustainable sound control method. And then um, chemicals are always the last resort. Thanks, Marcy. I went ahead and put up um, the link in the chat for directly to uh, the tomato page for UC IPM. We also had a few questions about thrips and, you know, do oils work? Does neem work? So I put in the chat also the um, the direct link to the thrips so that people could pop right there and pick out what control method methods they do want to use. That's one thing I will say about the UC Master Gardener program is that we always start with the with the least toxic, least whatever, and um, let our gardeners decide what works for them and, and their lifestyle and what they uh, plan to do in their yard. So uh, right. the, the, that, that take home message for me is identify what you've got going on though first, um, just because your pest looks like the little pest on the, the spray bottle at the, you know, the, the nursery store or something like that. you really want to get your pest or disease or issues um, identified before you start treating, doing any type of treatment plan? Yeah, I think one of your first slides really hit home for me. It was like, start off right. Yeah. You'll have less of these problems. But then if you do get these problems, know what you're looking at and then treat just that. Um, I know a lot of people worry about treating things and ruining bees and doing things like that. So this is one way where you can treat exactly what you're dealing with. So I am definitely a snail picker upper. Yeah. Um, I may have to buy a little hand vacuum to pick up all the other bugs now. I love that idea. That was a great idea. Great <laughs> suggestion. You know, and if you're not into planting winter gardens, um, it would be great, you know, a great idea to maybe plant a cover crop to replenish um, some of the soil nutrients that, um, you know, might have been depleted from all of your summer vegetable crops that you had growing. And then you would work that cover crop into the spring uh, right before planting to give it some time to decompose in the ground and add all that nitrogen and, and goodness back to your soil. Compost is also great of starting off with healthy soil. Um, you know, mending your soils with manures, as long as you they're processed and, and finished, uh, ready to add to the soil, you don't want to directly plant into a hot manure. But there's lots of things that you can do to give your tomatoes a, a good start from the get-go. Um, so Marcy, uh, one quick question for you. Ground covers, not mulch, it's an actual ground cover of a living plant, correct? Correct. Okay. So mulch is good. We just want to make sure for any plants that we're keeping mulch away from the base of the plant that can um, lead to different rots um, where if the, the soil's not drying out enough, um, root rots and things like that, crown rots. And so we don't want a volcano and we don't want to pile like a, a wood chip or something like that right up next to yeah. the plant. You want to give it, you know, three, four inch circle around the plant. Um at least to just, but mulch is great on helping to suppress weeds of keeping soil moisture in. I'm talking about ground covers. Well, actually insects, you know, some insects might harbor over winter in a, in a, in a bark. I'm not saying that they don't, but they don't really have a food source. So they're really looking for weedy ground covers, or if you've got some kind of low growing ground cover intentionally growing close by, um, that could be a site where certain um, pests would overwinter because they have protection, shelter, food, all that good stuff that they need to survive. Winter vacation resort. I get it. it. Close to the all you can eat upcoming tomato buffet. Well, there you go. Um, we do have a question in here that says sluggo for snails. Although we don't uh, recommend stuff by brand name, you could look at the active ingredients in sluggo compared to what was recommended on the integrated pest management website we dropped. And uh, if those are the ones that are in there, then then sluggo would be a good, uh, good one. Uh, yeah. But Go ahead, Marcy. I think with anything, the most important thing is, you know, if you're looking at baits, um, chemicals, make sure you read the directions um, and follow them. You know, neem oils, everything, even if you think you're taking a more sustainable organic approach, they're still chemicals. They still have labels that need to be followed. And um, we, we want to make sure that we do that. There's a certain time of day to apply all these, you know, to make sure that our, our plants stay healthy. And we don't want to do more. It's something, you know, we'll get that in our master gardener office. Well, it said to add, you know, a tablespoon. So I added two because I thought that would help, you know, would be more is better. Um, so you really want to make sure you're following the, the instructions that are on the labels or in the IPM um, pest notes, as we call them, on managing, managing specific pests or diseases. 
I will say more is better at dessert time. Maybe not, you know, any I other time. I agree with that. <laughs> tacos. Tacos. There we go. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Uh, we do have some people confessing in the comments, Marcy, about uh, that they go out at night and pick slugs and snails with a headlamp on so they can oh, use both hands. I love it. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we are all getting creative here. So that is great. Um, just a question for everyone who joined us today. Uh, what is your favorite tomato variety that you're growing this year? I recently harvested some of my ace tomatoes that... Um, I couldn't find at the beginning of the pandemic, found a little farther on, planted them. They came through great. And they're my new favorite for this year. So Ace is my favorite one. It makes Marcy, it makes me want to go back and find the label and see if it has Fusarian wilt and all the other stuff. Um, if I can plant this variety next year, if this is something that's going to be, uh, you know, now that I'm more educated on tomato choosing, if it's something that I'll plant again. But so far, the flavor is amazing. Any, I, I agree. I love ace tomatoes. Um, I like the sun golds for the cherry tomatoes. One of, one of the things that you mentioned that is super important that we give um, as a recommendation in our just general uh, vegetable gardening classes is journaling. You mentioned the word journal. And I kind of wanted to just play off that just for a second. Um, you know, you may think, oh, I'll remember my favorite variety of tomatoes. I'll, I'll remember that this plant did really well. Pro I, trust me, come next year when you're shopping for tomatoes or looking at seeds, those, you know, thoughts that you're thinking July, August, when you're diving into these lovely, juicy tomatoes that did so well in your garden, you're going to have a hard time forgetting next year. Oh. So journaling what did well, journaling where you planted things, what didn't grow well, when did you plant them? What issues did you have? All, you know, comes in handy when we're gardening with anything, any type of um, crop or plants that we can keep plant tags, um, write down notes, yes. keep for next year. Um, we got some comments rolling in about their favorite varieties. We've got pineapple. We got San Marzano, which I believe is a paste tomato, which I can mm -hmm. agree is a tasty, tasty good. Mm -hmm. Aunt Ruby's German green with an exclamation point, I might add. That's a nice a, heirloom sounding yeah, tomato. Aroma, which I do love a good aroma because I'm going to make some good stuff with it. We have a sun golds. We have a couple sun golds, Marcy. You got some good, uh, you got some good, uh, good people there. Another San Marzano, man. Pineapple pig is becoming a good one. Beef steaks were picky for sun and shade. Red boar, pink boar have been my top producers right now, along with chocolate sprinkled cherry. It sounds like we got a bunch of fancy people on here with the tomatoes, man. Oh, that sounds awesome. The heirlooms are a lot of fun. Um, really you know, are. a lot of times with heirlooms, you're not going to have the you're not going to have the options to buy disease resistant. They're not hybridized, so you know you're you're going to deal with more. Um, wilts and viruses and things like that but you, man you get a lot of fun colors and textures and shapes and names um i have a master gardener here in our county that in his garden he had some space he had 45 different heirloom tomatoes um oh my it gosh. was so fun to do a tomato tasting at his house um barbara just said inca jewel which is a paste tomato i feel like Not we have a lot of people we have a lot of people here who are canning i mean if we have some of this going on these paste tomatoes we have some people making some great sauces canning and preserving for um for the future uh, yeah. mr stripey from seed i saved last year are doing great barbara that's a whole nother level of seed yeah. saving like that's a whole nother presentation yeah so um, and i so think I think uh, I just want to throw in real quick too that if you have questions, you know, if you're new to growing tomatoes or gardening, you know, we've we've had a lot of people with um, this pandemic and sheltering at home and, and working from home that have branched out to to start growing vegetables and maybe haven't before. Um, maybe you don't have a, an in ground spot and you want to learn about container gardening. Your local master gardener office is a great resource to contact because they're going to know when to plant for your specific area what's going to grow well, um, soil types in your area, water, you know, do you have a lot of sodium in your water or, or any water issues. So definitely reach out to your local master gardener office. Um, if you have specific questions, you know, about growing tomatoes in your, your region. Marcy, I went ahead and dropped a link to find your local group. So hopefully people will pick that up and go ahead and contact their local, awesome. local group. Oh, we have San Marzano's make good salsa. Ooh, I like it. Try that. I know. Um, I will say that both Marcy and I have been um, pickling and canning uh, cucumbers and peaches. So 
it's nice to see that we are all trying to preserve our harvest and extend this wonderful season of tomatoes. Now I haven't got the pressure cannery out yet to do the tomatoes. So I've been boiling water back canning, but that'll be the next project. I, I heard a little sigh in there. It's a lot of work, but I think it's really worth it because with all this uh, fresh produce going around, especially um, I know where I live, we have a lot of fresh produce and fresh farm stands. And um, if you're, even if you don't have enough to can your own, you can go out there and get some and, and uh, preserve. And with that, we do have the Master Food, the University of California Master Food Preserver um, group. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up the link for that. Awesome. They're a great resource in answering food preservation questions and giving classes. I know a lot of them are switching to virtual classes as well. Um, our local Master Food Preservers are lining up um, some how-to videos, you know, 20, 25 minute how-to videos. Um, I will I will say this as someone who is who started canning and then realized there's like recipes. Um, <laughs> please follow the recipes. There's health and safety stuff that when you start canning that you should know about and just the safety if you especially if you're going to share with other people, it's great to follow um, recipes on science research based stuff. And that's where you're going to find the UC Master Food Preserver program to help you out with that. And then you have the UC Master Gardener program us to help you grow that food. So we really do appreciate everyone coming. Um, not seeing the link for the group. Let me drop that um, group again. I'm gonna drop the find us for the UC Master Gardener program. You can also Google us, um, okay. UC Master Gardeners, and there's a contact page and it has all the counties listed. Find us. Hopefully that pops up. Marcy, do you have any like words of wisdom for a new tomato grower? Patience, be patient. Um, you know, some years you'll see really great um, yields and other years you might only get a few tomatoes off your plant. And so um, one of the things I didn't talk about, a, a blossom in rot or blossom drop, not in rot. We talked about blossom in rot a lot. Blossom drops. So that's something that could be typically due to weather. So we're really hot during the day. We cool off. Um, we get those nice where I'm at Delta breezes, where you can open up the house and cool the house off at night. Your tomato plants typically don't like that drastic change of hot to, to cool. And the blossoms can fall off. Um, they can also fall off, fall off if they're not being pollinated. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the vegetable garden that are just out of your control. Um, and so just, just be patient. Um, don't give up. And definitely utilize your Master Gardener office. They're a great resource in answering questions. We like oh to be able to answer questions. It's it's true. And it's really weird when you get a group of master gardeners together because we talk about bugs and we talk about plants and it's like enough foreign language to some people, but it's really fun to get a group of those people together because the next thing you know, you're talking about all these things. And um, I don't know, I feel kind of sometimes I'm with my own plant kind. And, like, and, for, and for me, it's satisfying to answer a question. Oh, yeah. Like I, I just get this satisfaction of like, I just helped that person or I just helped identify what's going on, you know, with their plants. So now they can try to fix it. All right. Well, it looks like we are wrapping up, Marcy. I just want to say a big thank you from my tomato garden to you because next year it will be better. I'm definitely going to plant uh, my plants a little bit farther apart. Um, Base. Yeah, I'm going to give them... I they're all it's just a big hug out there everyone's touching each other now i feel bad i may have to prune a little bit um, of the canopy out now but um yeah there's some stuff i'm definitely going to change next year i hope some other people have learned a little bit to make their practices better for next year uh great resources the uc master gardener program um the uc integrated pest management program and the uc master food preserver program so and we've got that growing tomatoes in the home garden as well that handout i think we were going to Oh yeah, I'm going to drop a handout in the link for you guys so you can um, so you can access that. It's a PDF document, I believe. So I'll pull that up and drop that in there for y'all. But um, Marcy, we're having a lot of great things in the comments and chat. So I just want to say kudos to you and thank, thank you to you. everyone. And hopefully we'll be doing more lives and having all this great participation. And I know I'm going to plant some San Marzanos next year I based on me too. That's yeah, just based on the chat. <laughs> I feel like I can make salsa with them too to make a good salsa. That, yeah. that got me excited. So I look forward to that. And I, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you everyone for joining us today um, on your lunch break or whatever you may be doing right now. And, and happy gardening. Happy gardening, everyone. Take care.